All right. Uh, well, welcome everyone uh, to our next uh, geophysics <coughs> and tectonics seminar. Uh, I'm happy to announce that our speaker this week is uh, DK, uh, Dr. Kim from the University of Maryland. We'll be talking about um, sequencing seismograms. Um, from uh, There's a recent science paper that came out uh, that sort of talks about these results. And so if you haven't got a chance to read it, you'll get to see the results firsthand uh, from the DK himself. So. Uh, yes, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to give the talk and uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, good morning, everyone. I um, hope all of you are staying healthy. And thank you, Keely and the organizers for giving me this great opportunity to speak at the seminar. And um, thank you all very much for coming to listen to my talk. And without further ado, let's jump into sequencing seismograms. So I'd like to start my talk by sharing this zoo of conceptual models of the Earth is inferior. And I got inspired by this recent review paper that Alan McNamara published in 2019. And I stole his figure in the paper that would nicely fit into my story today. Um, I'm sharing here six models and you can see common features exist among them. And all of these models have mantle, and mantle is illustrated as very active, and you can sort of feel that the dynamics of the mantle from them. And additionally, you can see these large geochemical reservoirs and tiny plumes arising from these reservoirs. But more than such common features, uh, differences among them are more apparent. And first, it is unclear how sharp boundaries of the, those sharp, sharp boundaries of those geochemical reservoirs are, particularly their tops. It is also unclear those structures are whether a single contiguous object or a poorly imaged collection of smaller anomalies. And how these models stem from also differ from one model to another, whether these structures are made of a thermal, thermally or compositionally distinctive materials. Another difference could include whether they are being active or passively resides at the core mental boundary. So you can see these differences get more noticeable as you get it closer to the core mental boundary, meaning our uncertainty increases with increasing depth. So overall, this zoo of conceptual model tell us that we still have a long way to go figuring out which version or which model is the one that actually happened in the deep mantle of our planet. So why do we care? Earth mantle is where the convection is occurring and is the driving mechanism for both hotspot volcanism as well as plate tectonics. And the Earth is the only terrestrial planet in our solar system where we can observe both of these features. So understanding the mantle structure and their characteristic is important to learn how the Earth has evolved or evolving as opposed to other planets. Now let's take a look closer at our lower mantle. There are various definitions to designate um, the upper limit of the lower mantle, but I will actually refer in my talk, the lower mantle is about a few hundred kilometers above the core, the core mantle boundary. So about two to 300 kilometers above. In the lower mantle, things get very interesting. Seismic velocities show more complex structures starting with abrupt increases in velocity that is inferred as a phase transition between perovskite to post perovskite. And there's more lateral variation as well due to these anomalous structures at various scales. And speaking of various scales, um, we have this large scale structure called large low sure velocity provinces, in short, LLSVPs. And these structures are used to describe broad regions beneath Africa and the Pacific. And we sometimes call them super plumes. And their characteristics from the data show um, anomalously low shear velocities and um, less pronounced compressional velocity decreases and sharp lateral boundaries as well as indication of higher than average density structures. And ever since seismologists started to use tomorrowific inversions, we were able to see these structures exist at the lower mantle. And typically when we talk about these large structures, they are the scale of about 5,000 kilometers. And so-called mesoscale structures have been found. For instance, there's perm anomaly as well as Kamchatka anomaly, and these are on the order of about 1,000 kilometers. Small scale structures, um, for example, ULVZs, or ultra low velocity zones on the other hand, is on the order of magnitude smaller than these mesoscale structures. 
And by the way, there are also structures known as omega ULBZ, that is unusually large ULBZ that are close to being a size of any mesoscale structure. So about, again, 1,000 kilometers. Um, briefly talking about these ULVZs, they tend to show dramatic reduction of S and P wave velocities up to 30 and 10% respectively. And density is also alleviated up to about 10%. And because they are so tiny and exist at the greater depths, we don't really know what causes the ULVCs. In fact, our understanding is fairly limited. And some suggest they are thermally or compositionally distinctive structures or somewhere in between. And this is because the melting will change the composition and likewise different compositions will have a different melting temperatures. Uh, often the ULVCs are uh, spatially linked with the surface hotspots and some suggest the presence of dense melt at the core mantle boundary region as well as mantle plumes. So denser ULVCs may suck up by this large scale upwelling and ULVCs tend to be located at the root of mantle plumes. And compositionally, there are various suggestions starting from iron enriched material, silicate sediment from the core, and some people argue that it is ancient subducted ocean and crust just sits on top of the core mantle boundary. But a current consensus on these large versus small scale structures of the lower mantle is that they are somewhat related um, in a dynamical sense. And some talk about these ULVCs locating at the, um, the, the, the edges of the LSVPs. But surely no one really know for sure about the origin or characteristics. So this is what makes this topic super interesting. This is the cartoon from a recent study by Yuan and Romanovich in 2017. And they located a mega ULVZ beneath the Iceland hotspot which they infer to be a partial melt at the base of the plume. So this is one of the evidence that a ULVZ can be located at the root of the mantle plume beneath ocean islands. An existing existence of mantle plumes is not really surprising. Some fancy full wave form tomorrow inversions already have shown deep mantle plumes beneath hotspots. So you can see these mantle plumes rising from the core mantle boundary in some of these hotspots including Samoa, Tahiti, and Marquesas, as well as Hawaii. However, for the most of the tomorrowic models, the mantle plume is not really resolved. In fact, you can see it's fundamentally limited to image the mantle plume, especially beyond certain depths using tra tra traditional travel time tomography. So at the bottom here, um, you're looking at Ross McGuire's uh, uh, figures here. And um, even he, he shows, even using a dense seismic network, um, deployed around Hawaii. It's limited imaging these plumes regardless of their existence. So the structures about a thousand kilometers or smaller won't be able to be detected by these tomographies, at least in the lower mantle. So you can imagine a tiny small scale structures like ULVCs of a hundred kilometers sitting right here will be completely missed. But it's very challenging to image using these traditional sort of a technique then how do we actually find or detect these ULVZs? We use special seismic body wave bases that are either scattered or diffracted by these structures to, to detect them. And here I'm showing a list of phases and their corresponding wave paths that are currently used by seismometers in most ULVZ studies. And you can see both P and S wave phases are used. But in essence, if there is an anomalous structure present, um, these phases would directly interact with the anomaly. Therefore, there could be an additional phase that may arrive well, either before or after due to this structure. In our study, we use shear wave diffracting along the core mantle boundary, which is known as SDIF. And because they diffract along the core mantle boundary, they sample large areas at the base of the mantle relative to other phases. So this cartoon on the top um, shows that SDIF ray path um, in an epicentral distance of 100 degrees. Um, and in case of the ULVZ present along that ray path, the bottom shows a wave field simulation how it actually interact um, with this anomalous structure. You can see as I speak, um, this S wave front is interacting with the ULVZ. You see this being um, the wave front, a part of the wave front is being delayed by this structure. Um, and you'll see this hole. But as this energy propagates farther and farther away from the earthquake, you can see the wave front will be eventually healed and you'll see this later arrival generated um, and we can be basically um, recording S diffracted arrival, which is this first wave here, 
and then later we'll have this SDF post cursors. And once we detect these post cursors, we can make observations on amplitude and delay times of these arrivals. And these measurements can be used to study the properties of the UL disease. Now we know what to detect, SDF post cursors. So it is time to talk about how we actually do this. And here, this slide has, um, I'm going to talk about how it's been traditionally uh, approached. So we focus on a specific target area, such as Hawaii or Iceland. And then we look at earthquake and seismic stations and the corresponding paths to see if the paths actually may have sampled um, beneath, uh, on the core mental boundary region beneath that target area. Okay? And your database may contain a handful of earthquakes. And what you do is you sort the waveforms by using a geometrical parameter such as azimuth or at the central distance. And here is a quick example from Sana's paper in 2012, where she used SDIF waveforms and she sorted with the azimuth beneath. And, and these waveforms are coming beneath Hawaii. Okay? And she sorted these waveforms. You can see the post cursors, um, SDIF post cursors show the nice move out here. Um, this sort of makes sense when you go back this here, the left, the snapshot of the wave field simulation, where the azimuth actually increased this direction here and the gap between SDIF and post cursors is getting larger and larger. So after you make this detection of these post cursors, you can learn about ULDZ properties such as its size, velocities, or densities running 3D waveform simulations and search for the right property that fit the data. So here you're looking at the synthetic waveforms that Sana created that reproduce this move out of the post cursors. And then she uh, discovered this mega ULDZ beneath Hawaii. But as you can tell, there are many locations that this anomaly can be placed and pretty much equally explain the data. So there is a non-uniqueness to this problem we're dealing with. And five years later, using a similar approach, Yuan and Romanovich also documented another mega UL disease beneath Iceland. And these are truly amazing discoveries, but what I'd like to emphasize here today through this slide is that the conventional approaches and nearly all ULDZ studies focus on a specific target. And this makes us difficult to understand the UL disease and their distribution in a global context. Speaking of ULBZs in a global context, here is a figure of a study that compiles all of the existing ULBZs that have been published. So you can see these red regions um, or paths are people uh, uh, where people have detected these ULBZs. And again, because individual ULBZ works are done by focusing into a a specific area at a time, you can see this map shown here is largely patching and incomplete. And I say incomplete because you get the idea of where they're found, but you don't really know how their properties vary in a global context. So in order to bring a panoptic context of studying ULVZs and the lower mantle structures, we take a different approach using a recently developed algorithm in a realm of machine learning. And a form of machine learning goes all the way back to 1763 when Bayes' theorem was pre presented. And this theory was so popular and is so popular and perhaps all of you here uh, may have basically used in your research. And, but, the, but then the essence of the theory tells us that we can update and improve our knowledge of reality as we get more and more data or evidence. And it became one of the building blocks that formed today's machine learning. And after 1763, you see many other discoveries or achievements that are also became the part of those building blocks. And by 1997, things start to kick off and you see a lots and lots of machine learning applications we face in our everyday lives, like Netflix or, or Jeopardy shows or so on. Machine learning and science is growing rapidly as well. Um, seismology slash, I'll say geophysics. Nowadays, we, we love to use what's known as supervised learning approaches. And this approach is nothing but using either template or labeled, basically looking for labeled or template um, sort of an object in your uh, more or less unknown data. So this is a very simplistic concept behind the supervised learning. So you have to know these in advance to look for those objects in give, given data. In seismology, now we can somewhat automate many tedious routines such as earthquake phase pickings or detections using these supervised approaches. 
Now things start to get slightly complex or more interesting, however, if we don't know what to look for in one's data set. In other words, we don't have our labels anymore. Okay, so we, we don't know how many unknown unknowns exist in our data set, and we don't know what different types of stuff to look for. And this is the type of the case we really, we'd like to think about because as I introduced in the beginning, the deep earth interior is still enigmatic and it's not really surprising to find almost anything in the lower mantle simply because we don't know so many things. Unsupervised learning is a field of machine learning that may be applied to this type of problems. So it enables recognizing patterns, classifying a similar or different object, even reducing dimensionality in data sets when we don't even know what to look for. Especially dimensionality reduction algorithms are ones that allow us to represent the data as points in a high dimensional space and look for patterns or clusters. So this may be what we need to use for our research on, on the lower mantle. Now let's talk about this dimensionality reduction problems with a sample data set and focus on a new algorithm that does such a fantastic job. So here I'm showing you a data set. What information is hidden here in this raw data? Could you make a guess? Well, this was a photograph of an Einstein, okay? Did you know it was an Einstein? Well, the more important question is what information do we need to add to reveal his image? So what we need in this case is nothing but an optimal arrangement of the shredded image. In other words, if you know how to sort the data, you would able to glean insights from the raw form of data. Then the next question is how do we do this? How can we identify such optimal arrangement of complex data without knowing what we're looking for in the first place? So now would be a good time to introduce this new algorithm we used in our study called the sequencer. And it's developed by our collaborators in Johns Hopkins University and Tel Aviv University in Israel. So to find an optimal order or arrangement in the data set, what we need to compute is a metric that can measure either similarities or dissimil dissimilarities between each pair of objects. The metric here can be anything you'd like to choose. It could be either L1 or L2 norm. It could be some sort of uh, entropy measurements like callback liberal divergence, or even as simple as correlation coefficients between each object. Then we construct so after uh, computing all these metrics with all, these, uh, all of your objects, then we can construct a fully connected weighted edge graph as shown here, okay? And this is an example of a fully connected graph um, that consists uh, a couple of nodes and edges. Each node represents an object, so it could be a piece of data, so seismograms, spectra, row of image, and so on. Each edge, so here the, these lines, um, represent the measure of the similarities between nodes. So if the nodes are closer, their similarities would be uh, simply larger. The next step is to find a path through this graph that would define a sequence that places similar objects near each other while maximizing the similarity along the entire path. And as we find this path, we allow double back on the same path. And then the sequence that you're getting from this, which is shown here nicely, in um, red lines are called minimum spanning tree. And this minimum spanning tree then allow us to find an optimal arrangement of the given data set. And on the right hand side here is also another example of minimum spanning tree. And in, by visually looking at this, we can get a lot of information. For example, graph length tells us whether the algorithm finds an optimal arrangement that shows the main trend in data, while graph width tells us whether there is a secondary or tertiary trends or even outliers. Um, for example, here are two uh, minimum spanning trees. On the left, the aspect ratio is about one. So ratio between the graph length and the width is close to one. So this simply represents your data, doesn't really show any new insight based on rearrangement. However, on the right here, when your minimum spanning tree of your data set is more or less elongated, and your aspect ratio is about 10 in this uh, particular case, you can see a clear main channel. And this can be the main trend in the data set. We could visualize it by rearranging the data set in that specific order. Now, here's a quick real data example using the sequencer, okay? And what we have here on, the, on this side here is it's a data set from spectra, from distant stars that are observed on Earth. 
So here each row indicates these absorbed spectra travel from the universe. The problem here is that we don't know where these stars are located in space relative to Earth, simply by looking at the data alone. So what we did was to apply the sequencer and find the main trend and sort the data in that specific order, and we have this. So the main trend here is shown in these different lines. And in fact, this is showing the Doppler effect, a change in wavelength that results when a given light is traveling towards the Earth. So the sequencer was able to find the signature of the redshift by expansion of the universe. I'm going to stop here for a second. And we've been talking about a couple of different things. We talked about lower mantle. We talked about lower mantle host structures of various scales from small to large. We talked about how we image such tiny, small structures such as ULBZs. We talked about limitations of previous ULBZ studies where people tend to focus on a specific target region. We talked about a new algorithm that may bring out a domain trend in a complex data set. So now let's take all of these pieces together and take a look at what we found in our study in the core mental boundary region beneath the Pacific. So we made a database of hundreds of earthquakes that happened between 1990 through 2018. And these earthquakes are large quakes. They are magnitude of 6.5 or above, and they're deep events. They're, they're 200 kilometers. Um, they're deeper than 200 kilometers. And we only focus on the events of which their epicentral distance is between 100 and 110 degrees. And we could maybe relax this restriction and go up to about 130 degrees, but you can expect as epicentral distances increases, the actual diffracting path will also increase. So things may become pretty complicating. So we ended up restricting um, ourselves from 100 to 110 degrees and have this 7,500 waveforms of which their path crosses the Pacific Basin over here. Okay, and for all of these waveform data, we picked SDIF arrivals and aligned them. And we also removed complications with various source effect uh, by using 1D synthetic waveforms and deconvolving with our raw data. And we use earthquakes of known focal mechanisms for these 1D synthetic waveforms. And this way we could also focus on 3D structures that cannot be predicted by simply 1D or radial earth structure. And our goal is to identify SDIF postcursors from our deconvolved waveforms. So here is our deconvolved waveform. And for those of you who are not really used to looking at waveform data in a raster format, each row here is a waveform. So it looks something like this. So the blues are, um, the blues indicate negative amplitude and the red is a positive. You see the, now the, all the waveforms are lined nicely with the SDIF. Um, and here on the right hand side is the 1D synthetic waveform that we use to deconvolve from the raw data to get this deconvolved waveform data set. And I, as I mentioned, the first thing that you may try is to sort the waveform by geometrical parameters, such as azimuth or epicentral distance. And we sort the data here by distance. And it really didn't do much at all. And this is totally expected because our search region is just too large. So when we, so we use the sequencer. And when we use the sequencer to identify the main trend, it was able to identify post cursors, and these post cursors were found in almost 40% of all of the waveforms. And you can see this beautiful move out of the post cursor shown in the sequence data. So it was quite surprising actually, because we have almost half of the waveform that show post cursors within the entire waveform data set that passes beneath the Pacific Basin. And this is far more common than previously thought, and this is only possible since we start to look at wider region more systematically. So we then looked at corresponding paths for each waveforms here. And on the right here, I'm showing you the fraction of post cursors examined at each grid within the path. So from left to right, the color code indicate what we label as regions or paths. Um, we have from zero post cursors to 100% post cursors. Okay. So for example, when you have this pervasive post cursors, we see this in most of the location. So about half of the waveforms, which correspond to any paths that travel beneath the Pacific, showed post cursors. And for your reference, the purple contour line over here is um, the boundary from the LSVP, and the black crosses 
are the location of five largest hotspots by mass flux. Um, secondly, absent post cursors. In other words, for paths where we didn't find any or a very small number of post cursors that spatially correlate with the region outside of the LSVP boundaries, or these paths are confined within the boundaries themselves. And lastly, exclusive post cursors. In other words, the location where we find all of our waveforms that show post cursors are mostly coming from Hawaii and the Marquesas Islands. Now we take the, uh, the waveforms with the post cursors um, in this red box, and we measure amplitude ratio as well as the delay time from the post cursor signal Then we plot it um, on the map here. Okay, so this is an amplitude ratio map, and what your eyes picks up immediately is this bright, brightest region near Hawaii. And in fact, the post cursor found in this region labeled an R1 has a huge cluster of post cursors that are three times larger than the typical pervasive post cursors. Okay, and again, all of these points although many show small amplitude ratio, are still the places where you can find post cursors. They're simply weaker than one from Hawaii. Post cursors from R2 and R3 regions are special in terms of the delay time measurements. They, they tend to show large delay times. And we think, what we think here is that this may indicate um, these post cursors would be originating from distant scatterers and traveling uh, through complex structures. And from the previous literature, this is also the region which corresponds to um, where people talk about uh, in the core mental boundary it, that they host um, a partial melt created by paleo slab and a group of U small UOVZ patches along with the slab debris. And region here shown as R4 predominantly show weak post cursors, and they don't seem to show coherent geographic trends. But since R1 region is very special, and this is where you see this huge amplitude cluster, and this is also the region where we find exclusive post cursors. So we decided to look here more closely. So the next slide, I'll be zooming in to this R1 region outlined in red. So now let's start with the um, waveforms. The panel A here shows the waveform that only passes region beneath R1, so Hawaii, okay? And they are disordered, so nothing really interesting yet. Um, panel B here is the same waveform, but sequence. And you can see this large amplitude post cursor that are nicely show the clear move out. And when, when I find each corresponding midpoint from the diffracting path from these waveforms, I get the map shown in the E panel. And here you see a very detailed pattern that is never shown before. Size of each symbol on the map indicates the amplitude ratio of the post cursors, and then color is a sequence of which the waveforms are sequenced. So from, from um, darker brown to lighter brown, the post cursor delay time increases. And you can see this lighter blue and darker blue, you see no post cursors, okay? And now you can relate that with this map over here. Um, most of the post cursors are coming predominantly found onto the northeast of Hawaii, so here. And, and where it's labeled in R4, however, most of the data show no post cursors, but only a small amount of data shows weak post cursor with no coherent geographic pattern as shown um, in R1 cluster. I'm throwing in two more panels here, C and D, and C is delay time, and D is an amplitude ratio of these post cursors. Um, and now look at R1 here. Within the post cursor cluster R1, the delay time gradually increased towards the center of the cluster. And the largest amplitude post cursors are found close to the northern edge of the LSVPs. And these large amplitude post cursors sometimes go all the way up to one or even above one. This simply means that the S diff waveform, the S diff phase, the amplitude of the S diff phase is smaller than. Um, its post cursor. What we also noticed was this anti-correlation between the delay time and amplitude measurement. Okay? And we suggest this was due to a localized anomaly, perhaps due to a mega ULVZ um, that's been previously documented beneath Hawaii. And you can expect once uh, the seismic waves interact with such anomaly, 
and it will eventually scatter or transmit through the anomaly that the post cursor will be generated and the amplitude of this, this post cursor signal would be gradually decreased as it travels farther and further away. Before talking more about these anti-correlations, let's, um, let's go back to this wave field simulation to talk about large amplitude post cursor that we see nearby Hawaii. You know, we have this amp large amplitude ratio that are being close to one or above. What we think is happening is due to transmitted waves through these anomalies. And now um, we're looking at these uh, wave field simulation once again and try to look at the and compare the amplitude between the post cursors and the, the part where the wave front is being healed. Now you see there is a hole here in the wavefront and it will be eventually healed as it gets to the seismometer over here. And you have this um, post cursors rising. And now compare the amplitude between the two visually. And you can definitely tell the post cursors, uh, the estate post cursors have much, much larger um, amplitude compared to the main estate. So this is what we think um, is happening for those large post cursors. But going back to this negative correlations we observed in our data between amplitude ratio and delay time, we, um, we ran the 3D waveform simulations to show this relationship is actually due to a localized anomaly. And we use a simple shape that resembles like a hockey puck, so, so a short cylinder. So in the inset here is showing the geometry of our simulations. And you can see this star here is an earthquake, and that's the UOVZ, the hockey puck. And the waveform parameters that we played with are the S-wave velocity variation, width and height of the cylinder. And we also changed the gradient of the velocity variation, so the sharpness of the edges. Um, and then some of the curves that you see here shows the measurements from the synthetic waveforms from some of the simulations. What you can see, what you can see is what we expected. Um, we definitely see that synthetic waveform produces this post cursors, and we observe this amplitude decay with delay time. Okay? And what you can also observe is the trade-off among a different parameters as well. So for example, if you have a ULVC model of a certain size, and you can expect to observe similar measurements, actually exactly the same measurement, using a model which is shorter, but has an increase either of velocity reduction or width of the anomaly. And then on the right hand side here, we simplify this relationship um, and showing the log amplitude by simply taking the log of the y axis. And you see this nice linear line, which indicates a localized anomaly. Okay? And in terms of the localized anomaly, um, this relationship can be governed by two parameters, as you can see from the line one is slope, and the other is an intercept. Slope here would indicate information such as geometrical spreading and attenuation. An intercept might indicate the parameters for ULVZ, so the size and velocity reduction of a localized anomaly. So this is great because now we can use such linear decay relationship as quote unquote an ULVZ detector um, that can be used to search for a localized anomaly in our data set. So for each bin, we use a post cursor measurements and see those measurements show log linear decay relationship. So if there is a decay, then you would see either a negative or you see the negative slope or blue color on the map. And if a place show positive slopes or red color, then the place wouldn't be hosting any UOVCs. It turned out that we find two main cluster in the Pacific, which indicates the presence of UOVCs. The one near Hawaii has a very steep slope, meaning either the size or the magnitude of the velocity reduction is substantial. The one near Marquesas is very surprising because this is a completely new discovery. The slope is not as steep as Hawaii, but there is a clear cluster of the negative slopes. Then how big are the detected localized anomaly? Now let's focus on this Hawaii first. As we see, as we saw on the um, slope map in previous slide, Hawaii region seemed to show a steep negative slope. And what we plotted here in this black symbols with a line is the data coming from Hawaii, okay? And then these red dashed lines are from synthetic measurement from different ULVZ models. And um, for a reference, another, uh, and, and this bold uh, red line here 
is coming from a same dimension of a mega ULVZ that's been previously documented beneath Hawaii. Okay, and you can compare the, our data versus the model, and you can see the substantial difference between the two. This previous mega ULVZ model wasn't quite able to reproduce such large amplitude postcursors in Hawaii. What we, can, we can also compare this by looking at the waveform themselves. And here is basically the data that goes through the Hawaiian region. Um, and this is basically synthetic waveforms produced by using um, ULVZ model. And you can compare the, the, the uh, amplitude of the postcursors. Okay, and there, um, this amplitude of the data is so much larger than um, this model here. So, and then we, we, we already discussed about this trade-off between the waveform parameters. So what we, what we did simply here is to use more skinnier, but a lot taller model. We actually made it like 600 kilometer tall, um, essentially mimicking a hypothetical plume model. And you can see the uh, amplitude of the, the post cursors are uh, almost, um, you know, similar to the data, and the entire fit of the waveform themselves also went, uh, turns out to be better. So this suggests that the localized structure beneath Hawaii is very special and capable, capable of producing very large postcursors, and this localized anomaly must be bigger than what we previously thought. Now let's take a look at Marquesas. Um, here is the Marquesas data, um, similar to Hawaii, but its amplitude is definitely smaller than Hawaii but it's very close to previously uh, published um, Hawaiian model dimension, which is defined itself as a mega ULVC. The size of this is a, a, a thousand kilometer in diameter and 25 kilometer tall. But because of the amount of data and geometrical restriction from earthquake and receivers, our data does not constrain its precise location and characteristics. Now let's go back to the slope map because we forgot something. We, we didn't talk about the places other than these negative slopes. So we have a lot of places of the close being close to zero. So this physically means that the post cursor amplitudes are nearly constant regardless of the delay time. And these regions are widely spread out in the Pacific Basin and also correlates with paths where we find these pervasive post cursor we discussed in, in, um, in the beginning. Since this cannot be due to a single anomaly, like a ULVZ, we think this is due to a much larger structure. So like rather a distributed anomaly, such as the LLSVP boundaries in the Pacific. And in order to test this, we test this two different scenarios where the waves are either transmitting through um, such large uh, undulating boundaries. And the second scenario here is the waves are traveling along or scattering along um, such large scale structures. In the bottom, we're comparing the data versus model, and data um, are plotted in this boxcar in black. And you can see the median amplitude of the post cursors from the pervasive post cursors show very constant, more or less constant amplitude ratio with respect to the delay time. But what's also interesting is that um, this data can be explained by. Uh, the post cursor observed in our edge on model, okay, um, in purple here, where the waves are traveling along the large structures as it's scattered by the edges of these structures. And the scale of this large structure can be estimated by viewing this uh, Fresnel width of, from a scattered kernel with a delay time of what we observed in the pervasive post cursors. So if our post cursors are due to the edge scattering from, say, the LLSVP boundaries, then these post cursors are observed at a delay time between about 30 to um, 50 seconds um, after the main SDIF arrival. And this can be coming from a point scatterer that is located anywhere around this ring. Okay? And the characteristic length of this ring is about 3,000 kilometers. And this happened to be on the order of magnitude similar to the LLSVPs. We also tested with more realistic model um, using a, a um, 3D, uh, 3D tomography model from Berkeley. Um, so, and in order to make uh, the boundaries a little sharper to produce these edge scattering, we sharpen the lower part of the Berkeley model. And, and here, you're looking at sort of the edges of um, the LSVPs that are being sharpened. Um, 
and down here is comparing the synthetic versus data and the synthetic waveform from this specific model uh, pro produces weak post cursors and they show uh, more or less a moderate fit to our data. But importantly, outside the Hawaii region. So this means that we cannot really generate loud signals near Hawaii using this specific model itself. So once again, this confirms that there is a localized anomaly that is not robustly resolved in the current 3D tom uh, tomographic models. And these weak post cursors, uh, but pervasive post cursors, may have been generated by sharp edges and complexities associated with the LOSVP boundaries. So to sum up um, the findings comparing between our data versus models, we find post cursors are, are being largely generated by two types of anomalies. First type is a localized anomaly, which is the size of a mega UOVC beneath Hawaii and Marquesas, and both data and model consistently show the log amplitude decay from their post cursor measurements. And another type is a large scale structures that produces weak post cursors that are pervasive throughout the Pacific. Recently, Mandala L documented tungsten isotope data for ocean island basalts. And what was interesting in our data study was that um, the tungsten isotope data showing a negative correlations with helium ratio. So specifically, where we have previously discovered um, mega ULVZs, Samoa, Hawaii, and Iceland, all of the data here um, basically shows these negative tungsten anomaly that was far lower than that of the ambient mantle, which is, um, which is in this gray box over here. And this indicates that the mega ULVZs beneath these ocean islands may host primitive geochemical signatures that relatively unmixed since early Earth history. And the mega ULVZ that we found beneath Marquesas may offer a, a test for this hypothesis. In case of signature, we observed that we, we think are coming from rather um, widespread structures. Of course, there, is, there are other possibilities, and I list some of the possibilities over here. A con conglomerate of individual ULBZs that are smaller than our wavelength and say they're ubiquitously uh, exist across the core mental boundary region may generate a pervasive weak post cursors. And another possibility would be um, the topographic undulation generated from the core mental boundary itself could be another source. Although um, I haven't really tested, we haven't really tested this. So um, this is something that we could uh, investigate further um, in the future. But what, it is, what is clear about the core mental boundary from our study is that, at least beneath the Pacific, is that it's extremely heterogeneous and this heterogeneity may perhaps be more widespread than previously thought. So the, for the next step forward, we are currently um, still trying to answer, can we robustly image the, the lower mantle structures and you know, answer more or less unknown questions of the lower mantle? Well, we have some thoughts and uh, we're thinking of expanding our study to other basins such as Atlantic, use other phases and go up to higher frequencies. And for example, you're looking at this SCS data from Jenny Jenkins and basically using the sequencer, you can, you can already see these post cursors um, um, that are nicely sequenced. Uh, the, no, sorry, precursors of the SCS nicely um, showing over here. We have to still um, uh, anal analyze these data sets even more, but it's very promising to use all of, all, all of using these diverse data set and even go, go for other targets of the lower mantle. Um, another sort of thing that we're trying to do right now is to incorporate uh, uncommon uh, multipath or scattered phases directly and use those phases for an inversion framework. And this here, the rotating globe sort of shows you the, the scattering kernel. Um, and you can see some of the kernel shows, shows uh, uh, lights up brightly um, beneath uh, the Hawaii, which, which, which could actually represent the mega UOVCs. And it'll be really interesting to directly invert these kernels and see what uh, the actual ULVZ look like. Um, for a quick teaser, um, you can sequence anything. Um, if you have a complex data set that you like to play with um, and then use a sequencer, please do visit the website that I'll show you in a bit. Um, go ahead and basically sequence your data and see what it actually shows. And this is a teaser that we are working with 
at Maryland uh, with my advisor, Pat, Pat Lekich. Um, and we're, look, we're sequencing the receiver function data from the US as well as surface weakness version. You can see it's nicely sequenced after using the algorithm. And you can, using the sequenced uh, data set, you can even map out the sediment thickness in the US this way. So, um, you know, if you like to collaborate, you know, please shoot us an email. Um, but if you'd like to also try it yourself, uh, feel free to use other sources that are out there. I'm a little out of time, so, um, but thank you all for listening. Um, and these are all of the ver various uh, funding bodies that made this research possible. For more detail, please visit my website and the sequencer page as well to play with your data. I'm gonna leave um, a conclusion slide here so that you guys can read through while I take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Yes, if, if you'd like to ask a question, if you want to, you can virtually raise your hand uh, and unmute yourself and put your video on to ask the question. Um, and then there's some questions in the chat, uh, which I can call upon. Uh, Xiao Tao Yang, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. And thanks, thanks, uh, Kim. This is uh, really uh, excellent work. And I'm uh, really uh, impressed by a lot of detailed work and excellent, pretty uh, frontier work. So my question is that when you, uh, when you were doing the modeling or to generate synthetics to compare the anomalies, not only localized, but also like anomalies to compare that or model that to fit the data in, in, for their at, like amplitude ratio, did you consider the uh, attenuation property and also other elastic properties or inelastic properties of the anomalies? Yes, we have considered all of them. In fact, we use SpecFem 3D to simulate these synthetics. And um, I know that a lot of papers that are previously published using these uh, 3D simulations uses some other codes, um, um, like CSAM and things like that. But um, for, for our case over here, we use SpecFem 3D and you know, we, we, uh, we consider attenuation and other elastic and non-elastic parameters as well. Okay, so the, like my question like is, um, so you still use the model, like the Wendy model, due to uh, that that includes the properties, so attenuation property to do the modeling, right? So it's not a generator, or not not try try to use different properties to see whether I wish uh, attenuation may fit that better. Or... Sorry, could you reiterate the question, please? I, I... So my question like you use the uh, I know you talk about uh, the software you use to do the modeling. So what I'm thinking about is the velocity or attenuation model that you use to do the modeling. What attenuation model I use to do modeling? Yes, is that a prime model? Oh yes, it's, it's a prime model. And we also tried with um, other existing models. I mean, for, for um, we don't really explore 3D, uh, uh, 3D attenuation. But um, for the models that we tested, we tested with Prem model, we tested Ray model. Um, that's very, that's a regional model in the Pacific. That's also 1D. Um, we also tried a, uh, the model that's uh, from Ritzma. Um, um, it's, it's an old paper. Again, that's like a 1D, also regional model. We, for the 3D model, we, we tried, um, like I said, the Berkeley model, the, 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 uh, the one by Barbara. Um, that's the one that we tried. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from the chat as well, uh, G Wen, do you want to ask your question? I can read it while you uh, unmute yourself. Uh, the negative amplitude delay time slope is distributed uh, in the further west of the mega ULVZ. Uh, but why do you place your plume model to the east of the mega, mega ULVZ? Oh, so um, again, we're using this S diff waveform, and it's it's an advantage at the same time disadvantage to use these uh, waveforms. Advantage is that we can search for a really broad region on the core mantle boundary because the diffracting path is longer than say SCS phase where it just bounce off from the core mental boundary. Well, the, the, um, 
This advantage, however, we cannot precisely locate um, you know, the location of these UOVZs. Um, so my question for that is, we, the, the reason why we chose that location was simply because that's the hotspot location. That's a surface hotspot location. We placed the plume model right beneath that. I mean, sure, we can explore more and more, but as you know, the four, uh, 3D forest simulation is very computation extensive. And this paper wasn't really about to suggest the model. We're trying to explore sort of a different possibilities of different possibilities to explain these pervasive post cursors as well as the large post cursors. So yes, you're absolutely right. Um, we should try, uh, you know, the same, uh, we should try this Gaussian plume model and placing it somewhere completely different or even, you know, right beneath where we see these things. I mean, you're right, but uh, we didn't really explore this, this, all of their locations. Okay. Does that answer your question? I, I think so. Um, feel free to chime in if, if it doesn't. Uh, uh, Long Jan Ji, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, uh, I'm interested in the machine learning method. Uh, so I have a question on how do you uh, train your model? Because I think machine learning uh, it requires a lot of data to train the model, to mm -hmm. make the model accurate. And yeah. the result is relied on the data, how you train the model, right? Okay, so here, this specific algorithm, we don't train any data. So um, as I, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, I can see. So the, the way that I actually um, introduced this was, is a part, I mean, machine learning is a, such a broad terminology. Um, it could be, you know, it, it could be a specific neural network algorithm that you can refer as a machine learning technique. Um, but I think the machine learning actually um, covers entire field of sort of all of these things that you see in this slide, you know, it's all going all the way back to the Bayes theorem. Um, and this actually, in my talk, I, I also uh, said that the Bayes theorem is built, became a, one of the building blocks of machine learning. And our algorithm, the sequencer, it's not specifically, uh, um, the, it's not an algorithm that requires any training. It sort of basically allows allow us to reduce the dimensionality in a complex data set. So it's like 1D manifold learning. So you don't really need a, uh, 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 a training data set before, um, you, you know, before applying to your more or less unknown data set, I guess. Okay, so one question is... Uh, and then, sorry, for, for if you wanted to actually for, uh, get um, the further sort of uh, um, information on this specific algorithm, you can also visit the sequencer.org website. And okay. um, the methodology paper is currently in review and you can also get an access in that through that website. So please go ahead and take a look. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And one more question is, what's the advantage, I mean, compared with the previous work uh, who mm -hmm. doing the imaging the command boundary, why this method is better to identify the signals, the post delayed uh, signals? Oh, it's not better at all. And, and, and all of the previous work that's been done are, all, all of them are fantastic works. You know, like I said in the beginning, um, you know, sauna, uh, sauna's paper, Yuan's paper, they all essentially use the same um, methods. But what's really special about our work is that we don't, we, we have, we now have, uh, you know, algorithm like this that we use like a sequencer that if we use this, the advantage is we can actually look for broader space, you know, um, because okay, these things are all individual studies, you know, all of these yes. little blocks or, or little paths are all individual studies that's been previously done. But um, we didn't really, I guess we didn't really have a, like a right tool, I guess, to, to look at a broader regions to systematically analyze um, a large data sets um, um, in these earlier studies. So I think that's the key difference um, of our study here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Paul Mueller, are you there? Do you wanna ask a question?
Uh, well, I can ask it from the chat. Uh, when you describe uh, sharp boundaries of these low velocity so zones, what scales do they represent? So let me share my screen. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you have a slide. Is, uh, okay, these low velocity zones, are you talking about uh, uh, the ULVZs or are you talking about um, um, large low shear velocity provinces or these large undulating boundaries. I guess he's talking about um, LLSVPs. Um, the scale, wait, what was the question again? Um, let me just scratch my time here. So for for um, these large uh, large structure uh, these large uh, large scale structures, we're talking about that. What you, what you see is over here. So we tested various scale. I mean, we tested these two scenarios here. They're very large, as you can see, but. Um, when, when we tested with the more, more or less realistic model, um, these large low velocity provinces are on the order of about 5,000 kilometer scale. If that's, that's basically what you're asking. I'm not sure. If Paul is still here, if you want to clarify, I guess I wasn't sure if it was the ULVZs or the LLSVPs. Or, or are you? Asking how sharp the boundary, how what the contrast, the velocity contrast of the boundary. If that was the question, um, it's plus minus uh, about five percent um, velocity, uh, plus minus five percent over um, like a hundred kilometers. I would say, at you know for, for a specific boundary. So, um, what I was looking for is the physical scale. You say these things have sharp boundaries; they're mm -hmm. very large objects. And so when you say that the boundary between that and whatever you want to call it, ambient mantle, uh, is sharp, are we talking, what's your resolution there? Is it 10 kilometers or 100 or five? What, is, like, what does sharp mean? They're plus minus 5% over about 100 kilometers, less than 100 kilometers. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, another question from the, the chat uh, from Susmita Gare. If you want to chime in, I'll read the question. Um, why was the S wave diffraction chosen but not P wave? This is a good question. Um, because I learned uh, this method by Sana, and Sana loves S diff. <laughs> but um, I would say, well, yes, P diff, uh, you can also do this, uh, I guess. And um, because we are only looking at S waves, you know, we cannot really play with, we cannot really constrain like densities and more properties of the ULVZs much. But if we fully utilize like P diff and S diff and everything, then maybe we can get closer to, um, you know, answering questions what, uh, what specifically ULVZs, uh, um, like mega ULVZs are, I guess. Um, and, and, ten, uh, and, Often, I mean, in most cases, S, S, S waves are in larger in amplitude and they're, they're actually less of, of the P wave traffic. If you, we need a specific um, length of, of, of our waveform after the S diff, like, you know, some time needs to be, uh, we have to have some, some window. And if you have this, this other P wave traffic comes in then that will actually mess up our interpretation. So. That's also another reason. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question from Xi Xi Zhang uh, about how CMB topography may affect the post cursors. And Xi Xi, you can unmute if you have more to follow up. Um, well, that, that's a very nice talk. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess, you know, you mentioned that toward the end that you actually, uh, you haven't really explored the effect uh, for CMB uh, command boundary topography. Um, actually, I kind of like to uh, just push you a little bit more on that, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 
I noticed that you um, you actually showed us the, you called I guess four different regions uh, where you see very you know uh, significant uh, post cursors R one R two R three and R four and R one is Hawaii region the R four you also talked about it you know the Macquarie uh, uh, region I guess is both related to clones. And also, they just happen to look at, at uh, uh, the you know the Pacific LLSVP boundaries, right? Um, I was kind of curious. How about R R two and R three? Um, they they're clearly they're not really in this uh, anywhere close to uh, LSVP, right? They're more like uh, near in northern Pacific near maybe some some kind of subduction zones. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So what yes. would be the cause? Uh, I, I guess you mentioned briefly there might be, you know, uh, ancient slabs and mm -hmm. things like that. And um, uh, so, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. So first of all, core mental boundary. The question that you um, uh, wrote in the the chat. Well, that is a possibility. Um, I I guess the you know, sort of the, when you look at the literature of the, you know, these dynamic studies of the core mental boundary variations, um, people tend to talk about like five kilometer ish or, you know, five to 10 kilometer range, I guess, of the topography variations. Um, yes, that is a possible poss po possibility, but honestly, I can't really tell you that this is the source for the pervasive post cursor. One thing that I think, one thing that I'm, I'm pretty sure about is like, the one, the, the large post cursor that we see nearby Hawaii wouldn't be really generated by the topography itself, um, but for, for other uh, uh, pervasive post cursor that you see around um, Hawaii, well, that could be, that could be generated. I mean, we, we, um, we just need to uh, explore more, I guess, in the future. And, and because we're using the SDIF in such a long period of data, um, I think five kilometer scale would be too sh small scale to be actually seen by our waves. So, um, yeah, this is certainly, but this is certainly the field that, um, you know, we need to look into more deeply. And yeah, and then you said about these R2 and R3 regions here. Um, yes, um, when I looked at previous uh, literature, there are some like Kamchatka anomaly. Um, there are some ULDZ patches beneath R3. And if you can see, like, I don't know if you can see this, when you look at closely in south of the Aleutian, there's also a large uh, amplitude post cursors. But when I look at the bootstrap sort of es uh, error estimates, there are very, very, um, the errors are very high. So it's not really significant, uh, statistically significant just, uh, for, for these ones over here. Um, yeah, there are many possibilities, but so far what we have uh, based on our long wavelength that we can think of as the, the edges of the LSVPs. Okay, so I'll just kind of quickly follow up on that. Um, you know, there are a few other hotspots in that, in, yeah, I guess we, in that uh, LS, Pacific LSVPs. Do you have data coverage to be able to say anything like, uh, you, know, you know, I guess places like, uh, um, um, I kind of forgot, the, there are a few hotspots you actually marked there. And, I guess you didn't no. really talk much. Oh, you actually have data you didn't see significantly. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. So um, there is a restriction, right? Because you have these. We need these large earthquakes. We need a deep events, and we need an epicentral distance in certain right. ranges that we are looking at. I mean, of course, I, like I said, we're only looking at 100 and 110 degrees epicentral distance. Uh -huh. We can relax that all the way up to 130 or even 40, I guess. And, and, and that you can actually get a large, much larger coverage and you can possibly cover a lot more space than what we have here. But since we're, you know, we're, we were testing, I mean, we, because, because that the, the, the diffracting path will get longer and longer, then you'll get a lot of complexities um, that would be associated with the longer path. And, and that's why we restrict it. But certainly, yes, um, that's also the part of the thing that we can look into um, in the future, where we use this diverse data set, not just you know the different phase or higher frequency, but much larger coverage data by expanding the epicentral distance may cover um, other hotspots as well. There's like Bowie over here. There's the you know I don't know this will actually cover the Yellowstone, but I mean there are some uh, some, some you know there's some hotspots over here as well. But yeah, 
Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, I'll probably send you an uh, email or something to follow okay. up on this. Yeah. yeah, sounds great. Thank you very much. Uh, I see there's some questions about the, the sequencer, um, specifically from each end. Does it always result in a unique sort of data set? When you're yes, yes. So that's, a, that's the um, advantage, the main, the key advantage of the sequencer. Um, we have we have tried to use other uh, a very popular method uh, uh, that's called T distributed. Um, it's called TISNE, T S N E. It's like a, one of the neighboring embedding sort of methods. Um, but most of these methods are somewhat uh, has this random seed sort of a thing where you have to. There, and also, there's a lot of hyperparameters that you have to tweak with. So you can actually see these different method will. If you use the different perplexities, well, the, you know, it will get better and better, but it doesn't always guarantee to have a consistent order. A sequencer does. Sequencer always give you a unique sequence to a specific data set you, you, you put as an input. So um, that's a really big advantage of just using this algorithm. Uh, and then from uh, Zhang uh, Shuzhen, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, why was the uh, Wasserstein metrics used for the sequencer and not the Kullback uh, Liebler metrics or others? Wow, this is great because I can tell that you read the, you read the paper. <laughs> okay, so yes, um, we, we use many other metrics. I, I tried L1, L2 norms, like I said. Um, there are many other metrics that you can try. Um, we tried many different ones. But this uh, Wasserstein metrics, the, the, the so-called the earth mover distance worked the best um, for the waveform. And I don't know, I don't exactly know why it would be better, but it's, it seems like because we're, we, you know, the waveform looks like there's, a, you know, there's always a zero and there's a waveform. And this, this, uh, this earth, uh, earth mover distance uh, metric sort of moves like whatever in the positive or the negative and then basically you know, tweaking that, um, I don't know, I, I think, I think in, in the waveform case, I mean, even with the receiver functions that, that I showed you too, um, the, the, the Wasserstein metric um, was turned out to be um, the very be best method for the waveforms. But I know that um, the, the previous paper in astronomy uh, from our collaborators, um, I think, in their case, the entropy measurement was the best uh, a metric that, that, uh, that, that showed that trend. So I think it depends on um, which data set you're working with. Um, if it is waveform, I would actually try to use the, the earth mover distance um, first before trying all the other uh, metrics. Cool. Thank you. I think that was everything from the chat. So uh, we will thank you again. And if you want to stick around, if people have other questions they want to ask uh, offline, they can do that. So thank you. I will applaud for thank everyone. You. <laughs>